this is part two of the video about using the JSON editor to code a configuration in Reactor ground up. That is not normally how you would do it. I think you would have like a forth and back approach in many cases, but coding things straight into JSON is something that the pros like me and my team and and uh, many of you out there in the future will probably enjoy because there are advantages and disadvantages of a UI and the JSON editor can do something on its own. So I want you to know what it is and how it works and and, and so on. So in, in this video, what we did in the previous one was to make the output selector here for the video hub application that we did on, on an FK, um, MKA4 panel. We, we had a little output selector here with two outputs, output six and seven, and we could uh, choose between these two. Let me just show you if I if I click this one, then I'm, I'm actually having them both selected right now. So when I do routing down here, then I'm routing to both of the outputs at the same time. But I can sort of select and deselect. So if I completely deselect, then I'm not routing anything to anywhere because there are no outputs selected. So this toggle function is the one we created in the previous video. But most of the time, we want this to be a press and hold function. And then as you just click them individually, you want them to select this value instead of toggling on and off. So that's what we will explore. And then I have a few other ideas that, that we'll pursue. Probably we'll try to move this into master behavior because we have already seen two things being repeated. So could we somehow pack that into master behavior? That would be awesome. And um, let me see, did I have some other ideas? That that would be two pretty nice things to, uh, to get around. So let's just check that out. Okay, so getting into the JSON editor for these would be easy by pressing here. Then we have now the JSON editor and I like to separate this out in a window on its own. That makes it easy to go forth and back. Uh, maybe just recap what we have done in the JSON. We have defined the name of the root layer, which is this one, let's just unpack it. So we have this no name layer in here. Um, the variable we have defined is output selected gives us two values, six and seven for selecting the output. So those are the ones that we are choosing between. We have an HVC key map that makes sure that the alias is the keys that we are using to define our behaviors get mapped onto the right component numbers like panel two, component 17, 18, 19, and so on. We have a set of layers. Actually, there's only one layer. That is the layer no name. And I think I want to just quickly add a name to it. Oops. What did I just do there? So um, control space name. That's the property, the field that we want to put in and then just put in input here. We can save this real quick and we see that we have changed the name of the layer. So that's neat. We have these two, the output selection going on down on the um, on, on the root layer. Uh, and that is what we see right here. These behaviors are, are defined right uh, here and um, D1 and D2. Uh, in fact, uh, why not just move those into a layer of themselves? So we could just quickly do that as well. We need to watch the commas all the time with JSON. You need to be aware of that. And then I'll paste it in here. And I think if I save, yes, I get that into its own layer. And why not just name this layer outputs like that. Let's just format code, save. Yes, that's nice and, and sweet now. So the idea of doing that, what, what we did on the, on the input layer up here was to have default feedback on the layer level because that gave me a chance to put in like a standard color for all of them and also a title like input in the displays and they could be dimmed by default and so on. And why not do the same for the output layers? So let's just go down here, paste this in. I just copied it with uh, command C, command V and we will choose, um, now let's choose Amber instead and then we type in output here. And also dimmed, let's just save. See, it, as we save, nothing is really happening on the outputs up here. Why? Because we have in D1 and D2, we have defined, uh, hard-coded the color of these. So if I remove that color and if I do the same down here, let's just save and you'll see one of these are changing to amber, but I remove it down here as well. Then they are inheriting that color information from the default feedback of the layer itself. So that layer information is inherited. We can do the same for dim. There's no reason why we have dimmed once again in here. So I'll just remove that. And by the way, if you want to see how that looks in the UI, we could click in on, let me see, we did this for D1. Okay, so in D1, we removed it already. We can show more and you go into default feedback and you see no intensity, no colors being set. But on D2, we would still have an intensity being set to dimmed. That's exactly, let me see, that information right there. So we can take that out of the equation like that. 
and you see it's still picking up the color from, from underneath. We can also remove the title. Now now we would need to reboot, uh, reload the page here. So I just did. And we, we can see for D2 that is taken out uh, here. If I remove the, uh, the title output, which is um, just to show you that this is actually what is defining the label up here for that display, and the other one is defined for, for D1 right here. If I take that out completely, it will just as well use this up here, inherit that one. And to make sure that you can see it, let's just spell this all out in uppercase like that. So <clears throat> as I'm saving, once again, the behavior where we removed it is inheriting from the default behavior of the layer. And now I'll just remove it from the second one as well like that and we are now taking this the input and the output labels from the default feedback of the layers uh, let's try to collapse this if i hold down shift and i click here and i think if i move if i open up these layers without holding shift down there's a very nice way you can sort of get your json structure as it is a tree like that you can open it up uh, partly and that might be super convenient. So now we could, for instance, look at the default feedback in both cases. Now I, I want to, for this one, hold down shift to have it all opened up. Okay, let's just see. To have consistency, I will just spell this out in uppercase as well. We have green code, we have amber down there. That looks pretty neat and tidy. <clears throat> it feels like we should just go ahead and work with the uh, master behaviors right away. So what I want to do is to go in here, control space, let me see, master behaviors, thank you. And then we can define a master behavior in here. For that, I, I would want to have one we call um, input select. Oops. Ah, I'm on a different keyboard than I'm used to. So that's why it's so much fun to write on it. And I make a lot of mistakes. So input select is one behavior that we have created. Now, if I save this, we just get this dummy master behavior down here. And we will make another one called output select. So those two. In preparation, we'll just create them. And uh, that's done by now. So the idea would be to look at the structure inside one of my input behaviors I've created here. I have this, um, the, the IO reference is actually in place for my video hub and it's using the output select variable. So that's pretty neat. I, I should probably just copy this over so, to show you what, what, we, um, what, what we can achieve here. This behavior, uh, I want if I, Look up parent ID, parent ID, and I type in the name input select. That would be a reference to this master behavior. So up here, and I paste the content from that in here. And actually, now my input selector, input selector three, would still work. But it is contrary to number four and six. It is drawing from my master behavior up here called input select. See, and the idea of doing this. <clears throat> is let me just quickly see if i can find it again um that is to substitute also number two uh, i2 and i3 those two behaviors has a lot of redundant information that we also want to to uh to change over so for those i would probably just quickly remove them here and then i'll just copy this one two three Okay, so you, you are probably thinking right now, now you just get three behaviors that does the same. And that is absolutely true. So I need to do a little bit more, but you'll see now, right now I just have, you know, three buttons that does the same because they are referring back to the same master behavior. And one of the things that we need to do here is to make sure that we have a constant that changes the value of the, um, the input that we are routing. That means this value, it means this value, and it means the value we are comparing to, to get the glow of the button as we have that uh, input selected. So uh, what we would uh, do to uh, facilitate that would be to um, create probably a constant definition here. Having a constant definition is a way to tell the UI that um, we want the UI to reflect an input field. And let me see if I can freestyle this because I'm absolutely, absolutely not sure if I can. The, um, uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. Ah, this is something that I never do like this. Okay, name, no, wait. Um, I, I have a constant defined, which is called input right now. And do we need to give it a name? Yes, okay, so input, that might be helpful. Okay, let's just see what happens if I save this. Okay, if I save this. Ooh. Uh, what is wrong with this? I need that colon in there. And that was much better. Okay, let's just check over here if I 
Um, go for the this one. <clears throat> Behavior, no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, add a constant. Okay, we can add a constant. Let's just test this. So call it input, confirm, add a value, add a label, add constant. No, wait, that's just adding it. Okay, so <clears throat> I know I've done something a little bit quick here. That is to have the UI help me to uh, figure out the JSON because I was not entirely sure about that. So let's just look at the JSON that came with this and format. Okay, actually what I get right here is how constants would look when I am going to add them to my behaviors down here. But I'm looking to have a constant definition. And for constant definition, I'm really freestyling. I'm not 100% <clears throat> sure about this and I should probably pause the video and do it. But let me just still see if I can What about the type? We need the type it says this is an, an integer. Maybe I can have some help. Okay, yeah, I can. Awesome, nice. Save current file. I actually really do think that this is supposed to be enough. So if I just click any of these behaviors up here, like this guy, yes, it is enough. Okay, <clears throat> guys, what you have seen is for the input select, I'm adding a definition of a constant called input. It has this name input and it's an integer. And when I click this and notice that i1, i2, i3, they are all inheriting from input select. Input select gives me an option to add a constant. Actually, I think there is a field here. We saw it. It's called min items. And if I say there has to be one item here, then I'm a little bit curious to see if no, uh, but probably this will happen in the future. It will force upon us to have a single, at least one item defined. Now, this is where we input um, a one. We'll just, why not type in router input as the title here. So we'll just do that. Uh, let's reload. Uh, didn't change anything. Probably using that one. Should use the title. There are things to improve. Okay, so for, <clears throat> for this button, or for i1, I'll just say this is number the, the value number three for i2 will add a, this one. This is value number four and for i3 the same. But at this point in time, we are and remember that we are editing the JSON that we also have in this editor. So on in summary, on the master behavior, on the master behavior, input select, we have this constant defined that gives this UI behavior offering this field to insert the number. Nice. If we go down and look at how i1 now looks with the modification I just did by adding the value three, it inserts this code. And for i2, it inserts that code. But now this was this was us using the JSON editor. So I would, of course, to follow through on that promise, ooh, wrong place. I would go to i3 and then I would add constants. <sighs> Not constant set, okay. That's a different thing for a different day on a different planet, maybe. Um, okay, I'm just cheating and looking what I had just above and coding that out. So input the values. Oh, wait, sorry. Um, yeah, values. Colon. And that's an array. I just put in five here. Get rid of that one. Save this file. Okay, so let's just see for each of these i3 we uh, did something happen here oh 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 guys we need to make sure this is a string yes it's a string it has to be all right let's just check so i1 i2 and i3 all drawing on the same behavior just different constants so what we need to do up in our master behavior, which is still just hard coded to input three is to insert that at the right places. So the um, uh, the binary set value that we're using would be behavior, oops, behavior colon IO reference colon. And this would be const. No, 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 const. And the constant is input. So this is going to pick that value and use as the value we are setting when we are pressing this trigger, this event handler, 
binary trigger, the value we are going to set will be the one picked up from the constants up there, all right? And then <clears throat> we need this to be also used in here, for instance. And that we can use curly braces and just insert it like that. And then finally, we need it down here for the comparison. Okay, let's just check this. Hey guys, already it's pretty good, right? It changed the title, so it says input three, four, and five. And as I'm pressing, wow, you know that was a lucky punch. But no, it was not a lucky punch. I knew exactly what I did. <clears throat> and I also admit that there are certain things that you need to know here. But we have a wiki page where you can see those wikiskyhoy.com. And uh, let me see if we can. Um, probably just search the site for IO reference and see what we can find IO references. Yes. So on this page, you're actually seeing some of these modifiers. And if you look at if the first index is behavior, you have like behavior, last event, certain things. We've looked at that in other videos. But here the behavior ah, const. Ah, there we have it. Behavior const and then the constant name. So there you have the reference that would tell you that this would be possible to to retrieve the value of the constant up here in this way. And we got that into our behaviors. We should do the same for output select essentially. So let's go to the output here and then copy this piece of code for D1. Um, and I think D2 is, is going to follow along in a moment. But we just uh, copy this up and put it into output select here as we have already been exploring a little bit. So just paste it in here. Um, yes, format the code. Let's just check the comments and so on. Down here, we will just like we did with the other ones. Parent. Yes, output, 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 output. What was the name? I forget so easily. Output select was the name that we used in the master behavior. And we will put it in right there. Okay, so we just need that to be done for D2 as well. Just copy paste, remove all this because it was sort of the same. So you see we are removing redundancy out of this code. And redundancy removal is a really great thing, especially when you want to scale your configurations. And if you look at Skyhawk configurations, they're like crazy optimized. There's almost no redundancy like that because we know all the tips and tricks on you know uh, drawing upon underlying data sources to create flexibility, obviously. But the um, now we, we sort of know what to do in uh, input select. We would like to also have an output select. And therefore, uh, we will have this constant creator. We'll just copy that paste, uh, copy paste that code over, call it output, uh, router output. So this is very likely to, uh, and this min item didn't seem to play a huge role. So we'll just remove that. The IO reference of this, yes, that is true. That is true at toggle remove. This is what we'll improve in a moment. And that value is not so good. So this is where we need to have that behavior. Wah, keyboard. Const and output. Let me see. That is the name of the constant right there. Yes. And we copy, paste this into the condition for highlighting the button. Nice. OK. So I sort of feel we are ready, except that we have not added any constants down here just yet. And if we are to uh, like use the, um, to be serious about using the JSON editor, we'll just copy the constants we had for the inputs and type in out, oops, outputs. Then the output would be six in one case. Uh, let's just save this and you'll see that it will be good in the one side and not in the other because um, uh, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. Um, and uh, so it seems like, okay, this one is apparently adding the value six for, you know, on and off here, but the other one still sort of stuck. So why is it that output select here is showing me six now that I don't have the constant six? Um, that is, that is a little bit weird to me. Let's, let's see if we can have this working if we type in seven, should it then not change around? Okay, it's not. Um, ah, okay, we forgot to uh, we forgot to add it to the title. That's it. Okay. So guys, if I um, the, the, the point here of confusion was if we go to output select, then I forgot to change this number six right there. So you see if I remove that out it just says out. But now I want to insert the value of this one. So I'll do that. Now I make a mistake on purpose. And you see that, oh, it inserts that. We need to wrap this in curly braces. And then it is drawing that data out of the, uh, the, the constant for displaying it correctly in the display. Super nice. 
And uh, let's just see if this works. We see that it selects seven, it selects six, seven, and so on. So where we are right now is we want to explore how can we have um, the toggle function on press and hold and then just have normal selection when we just press the button really shortly. And we will also code that in the JSON editor here for the output select. So we have an event handler called select. It accepts binary triggers. It's using the method called toggle add remove. And then we have uh, binary set values taking the constant value and using that uh, for the IO reference. By the way, this IO reference field is empty because it is drawing upon the IO reference coming from up here. That is a concept that I have introduced before. The idea is that having this IO reference defined on this level of the behavior will then automatically, by default, be used everywhere else unless you fill this in with something else. And that is useful when you have buttons where you want to have multiple IO references being addressed by the component. So, um, in, in, what, what we need to do here is to make an event handler. And um, I'm going to freestyle, so it might blow up in my face. Uh, we'll create an event preprocessor here. We have a number of options, but we need a binary to binary conversion. So basically, we are preprocessing the input value coming from our buttons. And we are saying, oh, I think this might be one of the places we need to know something. The input edge, uh, if I type in default, then it's going to be any edge. And that should be fine uh, for me. Um, we'll pick act down here. So any any act down action that comes in. Uh, what do I want to do with that? I want any act down to be um, having an output trigger of also act down. So that that's the one thing. This would just pass through actually. So let's see if we if we have this. I mean, it's in a sense stupid because all it does is it says, okay, we have an an act down. Oh, come on. Come on, I just need this up here. All right, so nice. So I, I should still have just like pass through of this one. Um, but actually, if I let, let's just try that. What happens if I use act up? Then it's sort of you know doing it the opposite way around. So nothing happens when I press down. Now I release the mouse, and now I press down and I release the mouse. So I've actually inverted now. I've converted. Um, Act up triggers are becoming coming act down triggers. That's what is, is going on uh, right now. Okay, sorry, that was a sort of detour. But this conversion, so act down is what is coming out of this. But the thing that I wanted to do was to add a repeat delay. And we'll set this to 1000 milliseconds. I also want to have repeat. And what is this? Um, yeah, different modes of repeat. Um, delayed means that I press and hold for 1000 milliseconds, and then it starts repetition of this. That's going to be interesting. Because if I do this, and I press this button down, it's going to toggle on and off quite quickly. You see? Ah, please stop. Please stop. OK, so what we need to do as well, and that was kind of the next thing that I wanted to do was to put in act up. It will stop after 100 cycles or something. I think this is stated somewhere in the help text here. But um, in, in this case, we need to specify repeat stop. Thank you. So as soon as I release the button, then it stops the repetition. Let's just check that. I press and I hold. After 1,000 milliseconds, it starts to toggle. I release. OK, it stopped perfectly. Now, the, first, the next thing that I want to do is to um, I think I have something like block leading triggers. How many leading triggers do I want to block? One. The leading trigger would be the first trigger. When I press the button down, it doesn't do anything. I press, nothing happens. 1,000 milliseconds, then it starts cycling. All right, so that worked as well. Now, the final thing is how many max repetitions? If I set max repetitions to, say, two or four. If I set it to four, it means that I'll have four toggles on and off. Let's try. I press and hold. I get four toggles. That's it. it. Stops. Okay, but in this case, I just want to have one. So I know this looks like a lot of hoops to run through to get through to just have what looks to be simple, namely a press and hold, and I'll do something. Press and hold, and I'll toggle. Press and hold, and I'll toggle. That's what we are doing here, and it took these lines of code, and that might be something that we are going to optimize because it's such a useful function. But isn't it awesome that the technology itself allows you to vary this in so many ways? Like you could have any number of repetitions you want. You can change the delay time. You could. There is even a way that you can change the repetition delay time. Let me see. What would that be? Uh, that's got to be frequency. The repeat frequency. If we set that to like one, so this would be in hertz, and that means let's just 
uh, repeat the repetitions to like four, we will now see four repetitions of toggle. I press and hold one, dong, dong, dong. All right, and that came just out of us setting the frequency to this. I think the default frequency is probably five, five hertz. So that would be 200 milliseconds between each. But this is our function that will that will do this um, for for this trigger for the add remove. I am going to just rename this, and then I'm going to quickly create a, a, another behavior down here. Um, Okay, and we'll call this behavior set. All right, and the one that we have up here, I'll have and uh, just quickly make an active if and set it to false. So this one will never be used because now we want to just work on this one down here and we want to remove uh, what the other one does. So for the for this mode, we uh, for the binary set mode, I need to see what options do we have. Ooh. It doesn't give me those. Those. What about this? No. Okay. Binary set mode. I think. I think we don't need it, but because by default it's gonna set the value. And um, what I want is it to just set the the routing. Uh, let's just quickly. T ah. Yeah. Okay. So we just save the current file. We have it's the set trigger is the one that is going to be used now. If I press and hold, it's gonna set. It's not gonna repeat or anything. If I press and hold, it's gonna set and it chooses output number seven. But what I want is, I want now to invert the binary to binary conversion so that on my act down, it is uh, doing the inverse of what it's doing right now. Um, let's just, ooh, wait, I still want to have my output trigger set to act down, that's, that's all good. But we have this time window to previous trigger. And that means for, for this to forward the act down, I need to have, it needs to, um, it will be done within 100 or 1000 milliseconds. That's what I know of this function. So let's just see if I press and hold, nothing is going to happen. But if I press quickly, ah, that's not true. What does it say about previous trigger? Positive, the trigger must fall within this time window since last trigger in order to be processed. Negative, the trigger must fall after the time window since last trigger using absolute value in order to be processed. Typically used on act up, where act down should be set to none. Aha, uh -huh. okay, so it starts the timer and registers as a previous trigger, otherwise it won't work at all. Ha, huh. thank you so much. Okay, so we'll just do that and... Um, Okay, so it's on the act up that I need this. And then on my act down, I need this one to be set to, it suggested none, so that nothing is forwarded when I press this one down, but it does register there is a trigger coming in. If we do this right now, it is going to still not work, I'm sure, because we need the act up to send, or oh, we need up here to say basically that we are, uh, let me see, the binary type would be, and act up. Okay, so we are acting on act up. This is the trigger that we get. Um, let's just check this and see if it works. I click, I click. So you see now just a single press is going to set the value six, single press sets the value seven. If I press and hold, nothing is happening because yeah, so I have this, it has to be within the time window, I press and hold, nothing is happening. So this set trigger is now functioning as I want. It sets the output if I release the trigger within 1000 milliseconds. That's what we see right now. Click, 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 click. Now I'll make a long click, release, nothing happens. Okay, so we can now go and remove the active if up here. So just to have that trigger come into the picture once again. And now let's just see, I click, click, click. Now I press and hold and it's gonna add and I press and hold and it's gonna remove and it's gonna remove if I press and hold over here. Guys, that was, how crazy we can go with the event preprocessors and how we can set up that toggle set, uh, you know, add, remove and, and single press that you find on uh, on routing or output selection on uh, video hub configurations we have done or video router configurations, camera selections. That is mostly the places where we have added that into the interaction design of the buttons.
Thanks for watching, and I hope it was useful for you to learn some more about the machine room inside of the configuration tree. I know this is crazy. I love sharing these ideas. If they um, scare you away, then I hope it scares you over to the home screen, because this is where we do all the uh, easy to configure stuff with uh, constant sets and the blue buttons that will give you access to that. Configuration tab is where you can always do anything crazy, either in the tree directly with the inspector or with the JSON editor behind it.